Well, those of you who've been here before will remember that we've had Bina 48 on the stage, in fact, a couple of times. And we have the real Bina in the audience here. Where's Bina? The real Bina. Would you stand up, please? And we have Bina's partner, Martin. It's great to see you, Martin. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this a long time. Thank you. So, shall we sit and have a chat? Why don't you sit in that one? Okay. Is that all right with you? Sure. I'll take this one. So, Martin, your story is so intricate and full that I had difficulty deciding where to begin. And it strikes me, since we've played this video, that we might go backwards. OK. All right. So Bruce Duncan, who's the fellow who works in your Terrorism Foundation, has explained to us that over the years, he has collected, over time, uh, Binas, the real Bina, dare we say the real Bina, uh, her thoughts and her opinions and, and, uh, and her impressions and have loaded them into this thing you call a mind file. And that the purpose of this is that this creature, this human who happens to be a robot for the moment, can survive. Did I get that right? Yes, Moses. All right. Now, you've elevated this into a movement, as I understand and a movement that seems to have a quasi-religious overtone to it. So can you explain what your purpose is? Because Bruce has invited me to come to the Terrasin. I intend to do that and to begin to load my own mind file. Excellent. So how does all this play into your grand design? <laughs> well, um... Generally, Moses, first, thank you so much for having me here, and thank you so much for creating Idea City, and congratulations on keeping it going 20 years, yeah. all of your other accomplishments, and I was happy to um, go into the speaker's corner earlier today with Bina, and we talked about what it might be like 40 years hence of yeah. Idea City. We so may it. you keep going for 40 years and keep going yes. after that. Will you be alive in 40 years? Yes, I will. Yeah? Yes. All right. Can you help me stay alive for another 40 years? I'll do years? my best. I'll do my best. Okay. So, so to answer your, your question, I've been very inspired today by the talks given in the cannabis section and in the uh, talk just given by uh, Sanctuary that uh, certain things are going to be inevitable. Like there's going to be more cannabis next year than there's going to be this year. There's going to be more AI next year than there's going to be this year. But what's not inevitable is whether this moreness has a socially positive character to it or a socially negative character. And we saw some of that with like the build the wall uh, slide uh, just a few moments ago. So my purpose is to do what I can and what Bean and I can do together, um, joined by uh, our, our great uh, executives like Bruce Duncan, to take this uh, mind file technology, this ability to capture your memories, beliefs, values, and to use this in a positive, socially affirming way, rather than to let this technology be used in a negative way. And is the purpose to achieve a form of immortality? Yes, I think um, keeping people alive longer is a socially positive thing if the people consent to doing that, so if they are being kept alive pursuant to their own will, and if their extended life serves a positive purpose. So, for example, we saw earlier today some beautiful slides about great-grandparents and, and who knows the names of, of, their, of their grandparents. I know it would mean a lot to, to me to be able to interact with my immigrant uh, grandparents who all came here from overseas. I know it would mean a lot to our grandchildren to be able to interact with um, being and my parents, um, unfortunately half of whom have uh, passed away. So this ability to achieve a techno-immortality, I think will create kind of intergenerational bonds 
that will only make society stronger and happier. So some unborn great-great-great-grandchild could meet you and could meet Bina. Absolutely, and we could interact together with them. In our company, United Therapeutics uh, Moses, we have a floor that we call the grandparents floor. And people are asked something, and the people who go on this floor are people who've chosen to retire after they've reached 60 or 65, whatever. And we say to them, you don't have to leave the company. You, you want to retire, you don't need to be paid anymore, but you keep your, your key to the building, you keep your email and everything, and you have an office here on the grandparents' floor. The reason for that is why do we humans live so far beyond our reproductive years? What is the evolutionary purpose, as was just talked about, for us living into our 50s, 60s, 70s? Quick footnote, thank you for leading CARP. I think that's awesome. So, um, thank you. so anyway, back up to it. The reason why, at least what anthropologists tell us, is that those genes that allowed people to repair their DNA and keep living into their 50s, 60s, 70s, that allowed those tribes to retain their knowledge of which herbs uh, in the forest and in the fields were healthy, where to go when the weather changed to get enough food. In other words, the tribes with grandparents survive longer than the tribes without grandparents. And hence today, you know, many of us have the ability to live to our, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth, and, and more decades. So it's the same thing in our company by, by welcoming and embracing our, our employee ancestors, if you will, quote unquote, allowing them to be on the grandparents' floor, our company is able to absorb the knowledge of molecular biology and engineering and talent that they've had. Now, what we're trying to do in our movement is take that simple idea of respecting the contributions of our antecedents and spread it forward to the whole society. Well, how magnificent in a much simpler way, of course, CARP an organization of which I am the president, uh, is devoted to the idea that we don't all die at 50. And I mean that metaphorically as well as functionally, because our society has been devoted to youth, very youth-oriented. So in a sense, we share a goal, to use one of Jordy's words. Um, but you go at it in a much more thorough way and, and much more deeply. Um, what does it take to create a mind file? What is the investment of time and money required? So I think mind files actually are created very automatically in our digital society. Our digital footprints collect a vast amount of information about us. All of the digital information, much of which you've helped create with your media empire mm -hmm. over the past several decades, the, our lives are contextual. People who live in Toronto or people who live in Vancouver or Washington all have certain bodies of similar experiences. So with the type of uh, consciousness operating systems that people like Jordi are developing, what we call in our foundation Mindware, with this type of software that replicates the way of thinking, the idiosyncratic way of thinking that we humans do, the mind file, which are all of the things that you've done during your life that have somehow been digitally captured can be operated on with this consciousness operating system or mind where and result in a digital simulcra of yourself. And in that sense, you have become technically immortal. When you're just a mind file, you're in a form of stasis, like biostasis. While your heart's beating, it doesn't matter. Once your heart stops beating, it's a kind of a legal question if you're dead or not dead. If you can be revived back into a digital doppelganger of yourself from your mind file and people like Jordy's mind wear, then you have never really died if you've come back alive again. And that's the purpose of the Terrasem Foundation is to encourage this process of mind files, mind wear, and ultimately mind clones of ourselves, digital extensions of ourselves into the future. That's fascinating, and I don't want to get stuck on this, though it is deeply fascinating, but I'm curious that your son Gabriel, who works in the Terrison Foundation, is called a pastor. Now, why would you call him that? 
Well, first, he chose that name himself. Ah. So uh, he decided to call himself a pastor. He's like 35 years old, so it's like a long time since I tell him anything uh, to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that uh, he, he values the um, beneficial aspects of spiritual um, systems and traditions, whatever the, the religion is. He doesn't look at the pastor as being specific to any one monotheistic faith, faith or polytheistic faith. He looks at pastor as somebody who is a spiritual guide. So he chose that name uh, for himself. Um, there are we, uh, if he wanted to change it tomorrow, it makes no difference uh, to me whatsoever. The, the Terrasen movement, I, I think people love a spiritual connection. There is something in this mystical black box of our minds that kind of Jordi, you know, referred to somewhat elliptically, that um, it's such a complex system and we know so little about it. And we fear things that we don't know, but then we overcome fear. Uh, this morning you had this uh, great um, slide up here about the importance of hope, you know, and the persistence of hope. So all these spiritual type of concepts are important to us as humans. They help give us additional energy and perseverance to go the extra distance. When I was faced in, in my life with uh, crises of confidence, like our youngest daughter having a, uh, a generally fatal condition, it was this spiritual belief that, you know, I could do better than the doctor said I could do that got me across that valley. So I think spiritualism is good. Um, I think, um, you know, all forms of uh, Buddhism, which are kind of like an agnostic, generally accessible spiritualism, are very good. And I'm, uh, I, I believe in embracing technology with spiritualism. I think actually spiritual concepts provide us the ethics that um, everyone from Jordi at the end of the day to um, the, um, um, the uh, cannabis guys who are talking about values guide us, the first lady who spoke from uh, the, the larger company, Afria, yeah. Afria yeah. she was beautiful when she said, our values guide us. Yeah. Well, that's, that's pastoralism right there. You mentioned your daughter. So let's proceed to this chapter of your life. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, Martina's had this extraordinary career. And uh, I've made the point in my remarks in our program book that over the 20 years, we've had about 1,000 people on this stage. Wow. Many astonishing people, many highly accomplished people, people of uh, great accomplishment, people that are easy to admire. But I must say that despite all of that, I have yet to encounter an individual with this kind of protein reach and scope of her work and the audacity of your work. And I'm, I'm just full of admiration. So to make this more tangible for you, Martine's daughter, early in life, developed a rare disease condition, which meant inevitably that she would die. And there was apparently no cure available. So Martine, whose background is in law, with a side of MBA at a pretty fancy school, decided that she wasn't going to give up. She was going to find a cure. Now, in a way, it's a noble impulse, but if I had that situation and I said, I'm going to find the cure, it'd be completely hopeless. How did you bridge that background to do what you've done? And the punchline is, she created a company, United Therapeutics, which not only came up with the cure for her daughter's situation, but now provides that cure to many, many others, plus additional miracles, which I hope Martine will fill us in on, and created a company that does almost $2 billion a year in revenue. So I hope I haven't stolen your thunder, but I thought I had to set that scene. Well, first, Moses, thank you so much for the kind thing you, you said about me. I, I, it means a lot to me. Um, I, just to be in the company of the other 1,000 people who've been here, I feel honored. So thank you very, very much. 
Um, I feel enormously grateful that the people in my company have been able to work together with me to find these medicines that help thousands and thousands of, of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and our medicines are also available in, in Canada. And, How old's and your girl today? She's 30 now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, I mean, believe it or not, it's as simple as loving to learn. It, it really is, is just as simple as that. I did not know anything about biology. Um, when she was diagnosed, I had, was running uh, Sirius XM, it's a satellite communications company I'd started, and I'd, I'd last taken biology in high school. I didn't even take it in, in all of college. But um, she was, my first instinct was to donate money and, and to find better doctors, but after I, there were, after I talked to all the doctors and the money wasn't getting her any better and she was in the intensive care ward, I, I had no choice but to do this on my own. And I'd like to say also, I'm, I'm not the only parent that's, that's done this on, on my own. I've been you know, honored to meet some other parents who've done it too. And um, I'm so lucky and happy that you've never faced that situation, but I, I believe you would, you would be able to do it too. So in my case, I just read and read and read, and I learned everything I could about the disease. What I didn't know, I went back to easier books to read, and, and then I, when I got up to speed, I read the more advanced books. I finally found a medicine. My, my main attribute, I'm, I'm not really, you know, the main thing that I think differentiates me from people are one, I question authority, which is another reason I love this conference. Um, and secondly, uh, my personal mantra is persistence is omnipotence. I don't give up. And I will just keep, when, when people told me, no, this can't be done, uh, when I found a molecule and they said, no, they wouldn't give it to me, I just keep banging their door and darkening their door until finally I succeed. I, I just imagine uh, every wall as something that I could punch through if I try hard enough. Now, I try to do it smartly. Thank you. Thank you. If ever there was a great T-shirt slogan, that's a good one. We'll have that ready to go tomorrow. Yeah, it's Persistence yours. Persistence is, is omnipotent. Omnipotence. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and I, I hope everybody adopts it. So you have to also be smart in your persistence. It's, um, I'm, I'm happy that the way my mind is wired, when people criticize me, I, I generally speaking, uh, don't feel offended. I actually try to listen to their, their criticism, and if it's a valid criticism, I try to adapt my behavior uh, to adjust to that criticism. So when you're trying to develop a medicine from scratch where there's never been a medicine and treat a disease that there's no treatment for, and you're not a life scientist, um, you're gonna get a lot of criticisms. And I got a lot of them. But I, I counted them and I'd write them down and I just try to one at a time cross them off. Somebody told me, you know, we're not gonna, uh, a big pharmaceutical com company told me we have a molecule that might work. We're not gonna develop it because too few patients have this disease. We're not gonna give it to you because you're just a satellite person, you're not qualified. Why don't you bring us an expert in this field? So it was a fair criticism. You know, I can't say it was an unfair criticism, but I, uh, I went ultimately to the UK. I found the gentleman, Sir John Vane, who was a Nobel laureate, um, specifically in this field of biochemistry. I was lucky because it turned out that, uh, like a lot of British people, they have a fascination with Africa. And um, one of his fascinations was that I had a satellite communications company that was tracking the locations of, of, of elephants across Africa using collars that would beam to a low Earth orbit satellite system. And when I showed him on a computer Afri uh, elephants going across Africa, Sir John was like amazed. He said, wow, this is so wonderful. And I said, John, would you be willing to be the chairman of my scientific advisor board? He said, yes. I went back to the pharmaceutical company. I said, how's about a Nobel laureate? <laughs> <laughs> So Martine threw out another reference, and this is again moving backwards through her career. Martine started Sirius, what we now know as Sirius XM. 
And she did this, as far as I can understand, because as a student, she became fascinated with a reference that she had come across in a piece of writing. Was it Arthur C. Arthur C. Clarke. Right, who talked about this idea of satellites in geosynchronous orbit, which could then beam across vast tracts of the globe. He envisioned satellites as the nervous system of humanity. Hmm. But you were a student of the law. I was a student of the law, and by that time, he was, he was long retired. Satellites um, were relatively weak, and therefore you needed large dishes to receive the signals, and it wasn't really a democratized technology. So I simply said, why can't we make the satellites powerful enough so that the receivers can be so cheap, they can be embedded in cars, and people could receive hundreds of channels of radio, of talk, of communication. Music knows no enemies. We could unite the world with satellite communications, which was Arthur C. Clarke's dream. Of course, people said, no, 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 no. And then I just went, drew lines through each of those, <laughs> those no's. And until, you know, finally, uh, we have the beauty of Sirius XM. I have people coming up to me. More people have come up to me and asked to hug me for Sirius XM than for medicines which have saved people's lives. <laughs> But Martine, again, you make it sound so simple. Da 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 da, I'm in the stacks, I'm reading in the library, I see this reference, <laughs> and then I go out and I raise a couple hundred million billion dollars and I throw up a bunch of satellites and see, it's easy. Is that well, how it happens? No, it's not. You have to be persistent and, and you have to be based on facts and physics. Um, I'm happy to say I'm a spiritual being. But that doesn't mean that like uh, logic and science and rationality are not the way I live my life. They are. Mm. And so I studied objections. I tried to make a determination if they were realistic or not. For example, on Sirius XM, an objection that was given to me is that no government would approve one company to control over 100 channels in every city and town and village throughout North America. Yeah, there was a restriction on ownership. I know a little about I this business. Yeah. I know you do. <laughs> so, and so... Um, so is this an FCC matter? This or was an FCC government? matter. It was a Canadian uh, government matter and Canadian content issue and, and all that sort of thing. But that, that actually wasn't a matter of physics. What was a matter of physics was there was no way to do satellite communications any other way. When you put a transmitter 22,300 miles above the Earth, it is automatically going to cover the whole North American content. Right. There's no way to subdivide that. And I explained that very calmly, very reasonably, and I said, shouldn't people living in small towns have the same access to hundreds of channels of music that people have in large cities? <coughs> Excuse me. Or a pilot. And uh, one problem with pilots when you're flying is you have no access to weather information in between the different cities that you're landing. Um, I, I mentioned this also to the government agencies that the same system could be received by the 100,000 general aviation pilots throughout North America and we could have real-time weather information that could save many lives. I contacted um, search and rescue organizations who operate in remote areas where they don't have access to communications. So when they got all of these different organizations to submit petitions into the Federal Communications Commission saying, please approve this for all of these safety, health, medical benefits, the Federal Communications Commission logically agreed that this was in the, in the public benefit. And I agree also with the cannabis uh, uh, gentleman this morning, uh, sorry, I don't remember all their names, who uh, thanked the public officials in Canada who have uh, authorized the legalization of, canna of cannabis in a safe, uh, regulated uh, way. Uh, I'm a person who believes the government is actually here to help you, and the people in the government are trying to do the right thing. And of course they're gonna be cautious because it's kind of like first do no harm. But um, if you explain to them the benefits of a technology, now we're gonna to explain to them the benefits of artificial intelligence technology and specific ways that that mindware should be written to create good consciousness and not tortured or bad consciousness, I believe the government will come in on our side. What a lovely disposition, don't you think? But. 
Those of us who've had to work with bureaucracies all our life know that they are often quite obtuse, and they certainly don't move at the rhythm that you want them to move. How long did it take you to marshal all of this? Well, if I can show you a, a video on, on I'll give you yet another example. A few years ago, as um, the Pope gave his um, announcement about global warming, and there became a, a, you know, a growing consciousness, maybe too little, too late, that this is an existential threat to life, um, I decided to embark on a project to create electric-powered aviation, aircraft, helicopters, uh, that were completely powered by sustainable energy, like wind energy. Okay. I can't tell you, Moses, how many people told me it was impossible yes. to power a helicopter by, by uh, sustainable energy. Um, but um, I did it, and uh, here's a quick video that can show you how it works. Okay, do we have that? John, Billy, can you run it? In 2011, United Therapeutics CEO Martine Rothblatt challenged her company to, before the decade was out, transplant an end-stage pulmonary disease patient with a manufactured lung and return them safely back to health. By 2017, they were manufacturing over a lung a month, and by 2019, dozens of lives had been saved. But the need for transplantable hearts and lungs is thousands of times greater and a way is needed to deliver these tens of thousands of organs without the drawbacks of conventional rotocraft. So the biotechnology company led by SiriusXM's creator, who was also an avid rotocraft pilot, designed an optionally piloted, fully battery-powered rotocraft. Together with her partners at Tier 1 Engineering, they built and flew prototypes that established Guinness World Records for electric helicopter distance, altitude, airspeed, and payload. As their electric helicopters move towards certification, they are simultaneously ramping up their organ manufacturing capabilities. By the end of the coming decade, they expect to manufacture organs that are customized to the patient's DNA, so no immunosuppression will be needed. These personalized organs will be delivered from their points of manufacture to the transplanting hospital on set schedules by a fleet of hundreds of quieter, zero carbon and optionally piloted rotorcraft. At United Therapeutics, biology is technology. So, you see what I mean, Martine had a spare weekend and <laughs> <laughs> decided to create a new form of transportation. That, that's no mean trick, getting an elevator, an, an, a helicopter off the ground uh, strictly on batteries. But one thing I'm really excited about being here in Toronto is my um, partner, Dr. Uh, Shafka Shavji, who spoke here, here uh, yeah. last year, and I flew in with him last night. Ah. Um, I'm going to predict that before the end of this year, uh, 2019, that we will deliver the first ever um, organ by drone directly to Toronto General Hospital for transplant. That's astonishing. Thank you. <laughs> and all of, all of the Torontans here should be very, very proud. A lot of people don't remember this, but uh, insulin was invented at Toronto General Hospital. The very first lung transplant in the world anywhere was done at Toronto General Hospital, and it took 13 years after a heart transplant for people to even figure out how to do a lung transplant. The most complicated organ to transplant, TGH, the first double lung transplant at TGH. And as a Canadian citizen, I'm going to be very, very proud to make the first drone delivery of a manufactured organ at TGH. <laughs> I didn't know you were a Canadian citizen. I'm an immigrant. I'm an immigrant. I'm a proud immigrant. Uh, three years ago, um, I was um, in a room with, uh, with about 150 other immigrants from over 100 different countries, they said, um, being admitted to citizenship. I'm very grateful to the 
Canadian government because it was in recognition of Sirius XM that they allowed me to become a citizen after never achieving the full thousand days and mm -hmm. 1500 days. So I'm a proud Canadian. <laughs> We're happy. We're happy to have you. Okay, so we're 33 seconds to go, and uh, the guy who runs this conference usually starts creeping <laughs> from that side of the stage, and uh, I'd like to ask her if we can have a little more time. Would that be okay? I guess. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think you have some pull around here. <laughs> so I want to recapitulate this. So a law student with an MBA is inspired by an article by Arthur C. Clarke, convinces a variety of regulatory agencies that satellite communication is an enormously useful thing, invents a new industry of satellite broadcasting. And by the way, you know I've always thought that the real radio is local, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> Then, when a crisis in the family develops, sells that, starts this, has the success that we've just reviewed, is now, now um, well, saving all of these lives with this new technology that extends the life and allows you to recondition some of these essential organs, exactly. right? Exactly. We, we can save the organs that are otherwise being thrown away thrown and bring away. them back to life. Right. And then, because you need a zippy transportation system to get them there zero on time. Carbon, zero carbon. Zero carbon. You decide to invent another new industry. Yes. Great. <laughs> now you can see why I, I write, I mean, holy cow. Um, but this is what happens, Moses, I think, when you know, we give everybody the connectivity that this conference is all about. Um, I had the immense great fortune to be brought up by two parents who loved me very much. Um, I had the fortune for their parents to be welcomed into this country as immigrants or the U.S. as that case is. Um, I had the super good fortune to run into the love of my life um, almost 40 years ago mm -hmm. just by accident and to share together our great love. Um, I've been lucky to be born in a time frame that I could transition from the sexual identity that was labeled on me into birth into my own transgendered self and be accepted by my professional colleagues and society at large. So when you provide all of this great soil, when you provide all of this nice water and this nice sunlight, and you don't traumatize the little seedlings that are growing up, um, a million me's arise.